Everyone ready? Ready, Paul. Yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, so let's get started here. Um, welcome to my first uh, webinar. I've actually never done one of these before, and I don't like speaking in front of the camera because uh, those of you kind of my lectures may not realize this, but I'll look at your faces when I'm doing lectures, and I shorten and lengthen things based on the expressions on your faces. So it's definitely harder for me uh, over video when I, when I can't see your faces and just being in the room, you have a different level of expression, but we're going we're gonna to give this a shot. And the people who uh, come to my lectures regularly are going to have to let me know how this, how this turns out, how it's done on here. Okay. Uh, there are a few, just in case you haven't done this before, uh, you can chat. Um, if I do see, uh, there's a chat option. If you want to type a question instead of speak it, you can. And I'll be happy to uh, respond. Uh, I'll take a look at it every few seconds. Hey, Ed, how are you? Hi. And, um, and then also, if you look down, there's a reactions. So it'll, it allows you to, um, you can like raise a hand virtually, or you can just clap if you like something and uh, so on and so forth. So you may want to look around while we're in here. Uh, just don't disconnect yourself. Uh, now, like I said, this is my first time doing it. So I'm, while I've been on as a uh, participant in the audience a couple times, literally a couple times, uh, this is my first time as a moderator. So I may fumble around a little bit here, uh, but I'm gonna do my best. All right, let's get us started. Okay, uh, welcome to Ancient Egypt. Uh, this lecture, we're gonna start off talking really about the beginnings. So while this is world history by a Jew, this one's gonna be a little bit more world history and a little bit less by a Jew. Let's talk about ancient Egypt. Okay, so uh, when you talk about ancient Egypt, there's really two things you're talking about. First of all, you're talking about the, this ancient empire. Uh, and secondly, you're talking about the, the discoveries of this ancient empire, which is a story in and of themselves. I will touch a little bit on the discovery, but I don't wanna to spend too much time uh, on that, uh, just because I feel like my time's a little bit limited to get us up through the exodus in time for Pesach. But uh, the discoveries, I, I don't want to belittle it. It's an amazing thing. It's like as amazing as putting a man on the moon. Uh, really, it is. And you'll see when I get to talking about hieroglyphics, why it's such an amazing scientific achievement um, uh, as uh, that, that man has been able to accomplish. Now, uh, Egypt was a great civilization for over 3,000 years. It's a tremendous period of time, and, it, and we can't even wrap our heads around it when you consider that it was only 1,500 years when the Western Roman Empire fell, uh, and then you start talking, oh, double that was the existence of this one country, this one state. Uh, it's, it's an amazing period of time. Uh, also, the advantage of studying Egypt is very little really changed over time. Uh, they thought their society was perfect. So if you're perfect, why change? So yes, you definitely can see there are developments. If you're into art history, clearly you can see, uh, you can see an era of Egyptian history just based on the art. Uh, but really, their society had very little variation for 3,000 years. If you looked at what has happened in America in the last 300 years. There, it's tremendous more variation than you've seen in 3000 with Egypt, which by the way, also makes it easier to study. Now, uh, give you a little bit more of a concept of how far this goes back. King Tut had his own archeologists. So King Tut actually had a whole team of archeologists that were doing research of their people from 1500 years before. Uh, which gives you an idea of the time. Also, Ramses the Great had a son who, although he was a prince, that wasn't his favorite title. His favorite title was chief archaeologist. So this tells you even way back when these ancient pharaohs had an appreciation for how old their society was. And then you got to flash forward right another 3,000 years to our age today. So it's, it's an amazing period of time. Now, the main reason Egypt became what it became is because of the Nile. Uh, the, in, uh, I'm running some Mesopotamian lectures right now. If you're watching those YouTube videos, you've seen uh, the Nile, the, just like the Tigris and Euphrates were critical uh, for Mesopotamia, then the Nile was critical for Egypt. The, Egypt had an extreme advantage of the Nile for uh, the, the simple reason that it gave them a dependable inundation. They did not have to worry about, a, about rain. 
Yes, some years were better years for flooding. Some were worse. Sometimes you had too much water. Sometimes you had not enough. Uh, but they had a, their they had an advantage beyond what any other peoples had with knowing that their fertile their for, fertile soil in the along the banks of the Nile was going to get enough water nearly every single year to grow crops. This meant they had a surplus of food. Now, a surplus of food means a lot of things. Obviously, you can feed your own people. It means you have strength within your own society because people, if people aren't hungry, they're much more peaceful. And you can see this all over the world today. Uh, any country where there's plenty of food is much less likely to, to have internal strife. Uh, in addition to that, it allows a higher class of people, to be careful that terminology, uh, but it, it allows you to have royalty because royalty are not adding to the amount of farm. They're not adding to the amount of food being produced. Same for the priesthood. So having both the farm, having, both, having this, this extra food that's farmed allows you to have royalty. It allows you to have uh, priesthood and it allows you to have a military because these soldiers also are just eating. They're not bringing you more food. So uh, for these reasons, you cannot go, you cannot get away from the, the advantage that the Nile gave the, these people. And I'm gonna mention one other advantage. The Egyptians were terrible navigators. They were awful sailors, but it did not matter. It did not matter because the Nile would flow from south to north. I know that's a little bit contrary to what one's head usually is. Everyone always imagines because of gravity, rivers are flowing north to south, but uh, uh, and just like the Mississippi for us Americans, right, the Mississippi flows north to south, uh, but the Nile actually flows south to north. Anyway, these sailors, they could just hop on a boat in South Egypt and that the current would bring the boat all the way up to the Mediterranean Sea. And when they're ready to go home, they just put up a sail because there was always a prevailing wind heading south. So their sail would catch a prevailing wind and they'd go right back south again. So amazingly, these people did not need to know how to sail yet they had tremendous waterborne trade. Now, the, um, let, me, let me get to this, this uh, map right here. I'm gonna share my screen with you. Let's, this is my first time I've ever done this, so let's see if I do it right. One second. Okay, uh, what I'm hoping is you all see a map right now, uh, uh, and it's a modern map. If Mom, can you shake your head? Can you see this map? Yeah, I okay. can see okay. it. Very good. All right, so I've uh, shared screen correctly, which is always a good start. Now, um, looking at this, this map, what I, what I want to talk about is, first of all, when you, where Cairo is here is actually lower Egypt. Again, it's working in reverse here. Upper Egypt is down here in the south, and, and lower Egypt is here in the north, because lower just means the delta. So since the Nile is flowing up here to the delta, then um, that's that. This, this flow right here, the higher ground is towards the south and the lower ground is, is, is up here towards the north. So upper Egypt is the south, lower Egypt is the north. Um, now this land, and let me show you what the world looked like to them. Uh, this map is a wonderful map, but it does not fit on the screen very well. I'm gonna try to uh, lower a little bit. Okay, so this map is gonna give you an idea of really their world is pretty much where this green was. The, the, the Egyptians were mostly concerned with populating where the green was because that's where the fertile land is, okay? Now, um, this was sacred land to the Egyptians. They did not um, like leaving their, their land. They believed, and uh, we'll get to their burial practices. Their burial practices are famous, uh, but they, the, the ancient Egyptians wanted to be buried on Egyptian soil. It was holy land to them. Uh, and this would have ramifications in the future. So for example, uh, Egypt could not ever really build a large empire. They never really, they tried to branch out a little bit for mercantile purposes, uh, but never were they able to build this massive empire like we think of the Romans or the Mongolians or the Mesopotamians um, for the simple reason that their soldiers really wanna make sure they were buried at home. They didn't wanna die on the road. So it was hard to get people to permanently, it was hard to get Egyptians to permanently settle elsewhere. Uh, and that's a, that, that, ha, that means that they would have to reconquer the same land over and over again, even when they were very strong and it limited the amount of real estate that they would ever have. 
Okay, so the next thing is dynasties. You always hear about dynasties, Egyptians dynasties. So just to give you a really quick overall, the dynasties, the dynasties are, short version is they're families of kings or at least somehow connected kings, if not blood relatives. So there are 31 dynasties in Egyptian history. Uh, and this is before the Greek conquest. So it's a lot of dynasties. Um, we are not going to go through every single dynasty over the course of this. There's just no way we have time for it. I am just going to go through and hit highlights. When there's a few people here and there I want to mention, we're going to stick with them. But by the way, there's a Jewish connection here with these dynasties. And, and that is that a priest, uh, actually not a Jewish priest, an Egyptian priest, but a guy by the name of Manithos, uh, sorry, Manitho, uh, he actually wrote a history of Egypt. He was a priest, but he was a historian on the side. And for the Ptolemy II, he wrote this um, uh, history of Egypt. Now, his writing, Manetho's writing, has disappeared. But in his writing, he identified each of these family of kings as a dynasty. He's the one who came up with this 31 number, which is the reason it stops at the Greek, with the Greeks, because he was working for the second Greek uh, king, Ptolemy II, or second Greek pharaoh, Ptolemy II. And uh, anyway, the, re the Jewish connection is uh, Manitho's, like I said, his, his writings were long since lost, but one individual quoted from him extensively and his writings have based him pieced together mostly from one, ind one individual. This person's name is Josephus, who's one of the, who's definitely the most famous ancient Jewish historian of all times, for most of you heard of him. Okay, one more background piece of info before we move on to the real history. There are three periods of ancient Egypt. You have the Old Kingdom, you have the Middle Kingdom, and you have the New Kingdom. The Old Kingdom is the kingdom of the pyramids. The New Kingdom is the kingdom of, of literature. That's where their, their great myths came from. And then third, you have the New Kingdom. The New Kingdom was the great temple era, but the New Kingdom is the one that all of you know, right? So that's going to be King Tut. Uh, that's Ramses the Great. That's... Uh, 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 Akhenaten, uh, that's Amenhotep, a lot of your guys are, a lot of, any, oh, I'd say out of the Ptolemies who are really Greeks, uh, everyone is going to name one of the, the pharaohs from the New Kingdom if you were to name, a, uh, name one. And by the way, regardless of whether you use Christian, Jewish, or secular dating, everyone is going to put the Exodus in the, the period of the New Kingdom. Uh, so the New Kingdom we'll, we'll spend the most time on and that's when the, we'll be dealing with the Exodus lecture. Okay, so I'm going to move us on here, um, assuming you're still seeing the map, and we are going to take a look at this map right here. Uh, now, I'm actually, if you look at the dates here, I'm showing you something from 1799, 1798, 1799 of our common era, of our current era, because I'm showing you the invasion of Egypt by Napoleon. Uh, and I actually have a lecture on this. It's a, it's a solid half hour or so by itself. So I don't want to take too much of our time tonight going over this. When we finish this, if someone wants me to do the Napoleon lecture uh, afterwards to talk about his, his time in Egypt, I'll be glad to. But I only have, I just want to really get one message across, two messages across. Number one, Everyone knew that, this, that the Egyptians were a great empire at one time. If you go back and talk about a, a learned person in the late, late 1700s, they knew Egypt was a great empire. They were all very well aware of Greek writings and the Greeks credited Egypt with being the previous great empire, right? First, in the Greek mind, you, you, know, you have the Egyptians and you have the Greeks and then their uh, successors were the Romans and the successors of the Romans are the Europeans. Uh, so, that connection was known, but no one could read hieroglyphics. No one had any way of knowing what was written. No one had any concept really of ancient Egypt other than it was ancient, other than there had been a lot of gold and interesting artifacts found. You had these giant pyramids, you had the Sphinx. I mean, there were, you had the obelisks. There were things to see, but no one had any understanding of it until Napoleon. So, Napoleon was sailing to invade Egypt, which is going to be, again, that's a little bit out of our uh, realm tonight. But in his efforts to invade, he also brought 167 
of the, the best scientists in France with him. And these 167 scientists would come to start the first systematic study of ancient Egypt by modern scholars. And it was within this, if you see Rosetta, so I have to talk about Rosetta Stone. If you, so right here is Alexandria. You can see from the map uh, on the blue that uh, Napoleon started off here in Alexandria. And, uh, and then after that, uh, he, would, he would move south. But a little bit later, uh, his soldiers were fortifying Rosetta. And you see Rosetta is just right here across from Alexandria. And in the process of fortifying Rosetta, they came across a special stone. Famously, the Rosetta Stone, you all know what I'm going to say, so I don't really need to, to try to have some great hesitation or ask for questions here. But I do want to take a look at the Rosetta Stone because it's going to be very important for our analysis of, uh, uh, of hieroglyphics here in a minute. Let me, uh, I'm just going to zoom in so y'all can see this a little bit better. I'm not doing this yet. Uh, that's going to be, that's Normar's uh, palette. We're going to do Normar's palette in a few minutes. Uh, I don't know why this scrolls so slowly. Oops. Okay. Here we go. All right. So this is the uh, Rosetta Stone. So this is what Napoleon's soldiers found. And this would be the key to translating hieroglyphics. And that means it would also be the key to, uh, to everything we know about Egypt today. Because once we could read their words, uh, their entire history came to life. Now, uh, the Rosetta Stone was actually discovered in 1799. It would not be translated until 1822. So let me say that again. It was discovered in 1799. It would not be translated until 1822. So even though you have this great stone, which, oh, I didn't even go over the languages. Okay, sorry. Uh, so the Rosetta Stone has three languages on it. Uh, the top one here is hieroglyphics. And what you see right here on the right is a, a close-up of the hieroglyphics tablet, which is the top part. The middle part is demotic, which is a Greek script. It's like a, a cursive, because you can't really write hieroglyphics in handwriting. That would take forever. Uh, so demotic was, a, was kind of the cursive version of hieroglyphics. And of course, cursive now even in English is, is extinct. Our kids aren't taught it anymore. Uh, but those of us old enough to take cursive in class can appreciate demotic. And then finally at the bottom, you have uh, Greek. And I know it doesn't look great in this picture, but that bottom level is Greek. Now there were plenty of scholars that could read ancient Greek in that time. And th this was really the key because each of these three sections say the same thing. Um, now the, the connection was made by a Frenchman. Uh, funny enough, the Rosetta Stone sits in the British Museum. It doesn't sit in Paris and it's in the Louvre uh, because Napoleon would lose at the end and uh, the Brits took the stone. So there it still sits in the British Museum today. Seth, Much can of you hear me? Of the Egyptian government, what? Can you hear me having been to Egypt, supposedly a lot of that stuff left Egypt illegally a long time ago? Right, so at this time it was, it was not illegally taken. There was no uh, appreciation by the, British gov by the Egyptian government at first to even keep it, nor organization. Then afterwards, once the great discoveries were made, in the uh, mid to late 1800s up to the early 1900s, they had a deal with the Europeans that when the Europeans found something, they would basically have to share. Like some of the stuff went to the Egyptians and some went to the Europeans who discovered it. And what you see in the British Museum today or the Louvre today is a result of this system. Um, now, uh, let me get back to the, the decipherment of the Rosetta Stone. The key here is going to be what you see circled. So the, uh, can y'all see the mouse when I do this, or I need to find a better way of uh, highlighting things? I can see it. You can see it? Oh, let me see. I can, yes, all right. Uh, let me just see here if it gives me an option to... Uh, uh, how about that? Hand oh, tool. Yeah, let me see what I got here. Uh, uh, let's see. Maybe cloud tool? I don't know. Let's see what happens when I do this. Uh, okay, not great. Uh, okay, so this thing, very good. All right, go away, stop. Okay, uh, so this right here is what I'm talking about. So that little oval is a cartouche. Uh, and what was the, the key to the decipherment of this cartouche was because an obelisk was found 
1815, so 16 years after the Rosetta Stone, and that obelisk had uh, two names in both hieroglyphics and Greek. The two names it had was Ptolemy and it had Cleopatra. So that's what you're seeing here, right? So if you look at the bottom of the screen, now I can't get this thing to stop. Okay, now if you look at the bottom of the screen uh, here on bottom right, you see Ptolemy and Cleopatra written in hieroglyphics. So this is what was discovered. Now what this oval up in the stone that you're looking at, that is Ptolemy's name. So these two words that were translated from Greek to hieroglyphics, Ptolemy and Cleopatra, and what was discovered was that a pharaoh's name was always in one of these ovals. They're called cartouches because the French named it. That's the same word they have for the cartridge, like from their bullets. They thought it looked like bullet cartridges. Remember, soldiers found this. So a soldiers named it. And so we still use that name today, which is cartouche. Um, and once these two words were deciphered, it would start the entire translation process uh, for hieroglyphics. Now, uh, why was it so hard? We have very smart people working on this thing for 23 years, uh, and they even needed this little boost. Uh, and even after this boost, it still took another seven years. So let me talk about hieroglyphics for a second. So it can be written in any direction. It can go up, down, left, right. Uh, so that's already a problem. Uh, secondly, it can be phonetic. Uh, like in other words, produce a sound, or it could be a picture, and a picture represents what you want to say. It could just represent a letter or a syllable. So, uh, I'll give you an example. Let's take. Let's take. Um, I, I wrote down a couple of them here. Uh, let's take duck. Okay. So a duck can mean a few things. A duck can actually be a duck. A duck can also mean son of. All right, we can appreciate that with Hebrew names, right? So if for an Egyptian, you'd have a duck for that son of where we have been. And then it also can be a syllable, sa, any of those three things. So you have to know the context of it to know which of those three it is. And now imagine the letter to the left and the letter to the right and the letter above and the letter below, they all are like that. So you have a tremendous number of moving parts for every single written word. If that wasn't enough, like ancient Hebrew, vowels are not there. So there's actually linguists still kind of debate today uh, whether they're pronouncing things right or not, because just like in the Torah, we don't have vowels, the Egyptians didn't either. Now, the advantage we have with Hebrew is the language was passed down. Um, it, ancient Egyptian died, so it's a dead language. There was no one who spoke the language uh, when it started being deciphered. Uh, nor anyone who really read it, uh, but it was, it's related to Coptic, uh, which also is not a spoken language anymore, but is a liturgical language, just like Latin. Uh, and the Frenchman who deciphered it, who was a linguist genius, I mean, he wrote his, his name was uh, Jean-Francois Champlion. Uh, he wrote his first uh, book about languages when he was 16. He was in the Academy of Sciences at, of France at age 17. He spoke a number of languages, including uh, Hebrew, Arabic, Coptic, Greek, Latin, French, English, and a, and a list goes on and on. Uh, but what made him unusual was he was probably the only European scholar who could speak both Coptic and Greek, which gave him the, ex the, the extreme advantage to, even though it took years of study, he would be the one to start deciphering this language. Okay, now, uh, by the way, if you're wondering, the Rosetta Stone is actually just talking about a, it's actually, it's some priests thanking Ptolemy V for a, um, for a gift of uh, money and prizes when he became king honoring their temple. Uh, so they created the stone to honor him. The Greek was written in his native language for his honor, and then it was written in Greek so all the Greeks would understand how nice he was to the priests of this temple. Okay, let's move on and talk about the, 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 the language itself. The, and I don't mean translating it, I just mean the mechanics of it, all right? So to decipher this, you needed a couple of things. One is you need great linguists, but you also need great adventurers. And I wanna talk about one of those adventurers in a minute who's gotta find all this. Um, but uh, the Egyptian language does not claim to be the first. And I, I know I just said this in my lecture too. It's not the first written language. 
It, the vast majority of Egyptologists won't claim for it to be. Uh, but every, every single Egyptologist I've seen talk about it says it's the most beautiful language ever. Uh, and they may have an argument there. And it's certainly one of the oldest. Now, it required a tremendous amount of studies to be able to, to be a scribe in ancient Egypt. It was, I, I think it's comparable to the legal profession uh, where you have to go to school extra and you're considered a, a person of learning. Uh, maybe I should talk about the way lawyers were looking at 100 years ago rather than today. Uh, but nonetheless, I think you get my point uh, that it does require a certain level of education uh, to, to be able to be a scribe. It's estimated that about one to 2% of the population was literate in ancient Egypt. And of course, times could vary. We're talking about a long period of time here, but roughly one to 2%. Uh, by the way, most pharaohs were literate and this would be different from Mesopotamia, because remember Mesopotamia has cuneiform. Most of the kings, there were a few, but most of the kings in Mesopotamia were not literate. Uh, most of the pharaohs were, and they both are very complicated languages to know that it just, you have to appreciate that the Egyptians put a higher uh, level, a uh, higher um, priority on the kings being able to read with the writing. Let's do a little bit of etymology. Okay, where does the name Egypt come from? Uh, does anyone remember I've said this before? Anyone give it a shot? Okay, so uh, Egypt, the name Egypt comes from the Greeks. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of times when we're dealing with Egypt, it's going to be from the Greeks. So that, that's nothing different. Now, the, when the Greeks first started coming to Egypt, the main city in, in Egypt was Hakapta. Uh, so Hakapta means... It actually is, it, it, it's an old name. Uh, you know the city is Memphis. So Memphis in Egypt, its original name was Hakapta. Now Hakapta just means hot kata. Hot is house, ta, ka is of, and ta is a god. So Hakapta, the temple of the god ta. Uh, but if you say Hakapta quickly, and by the way, the Egyptians had a guttural, uh, if you know in Hebrew, you have the letter Ein. Well, in biblical times, the letter Ein, we, it was not silent. It was a very vague guttural sound that we don't use today. Now we just see, oh, Aleph and Ein, they're both silent. But it was I not a way. Uh, I'm sorry? I thought I heard a question. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, so, so the Egyptians had their own version of Ein, this very soft guttural. So it was like Hakapta. Well, the Greeks don't have any gutturals. So it, to them, there was no ha, it was ah. So akapta, you remember with Greek, it has to end in S because everything ends in S. So it's akaptas, and then if you say it fast enough, agaptas, agaptas, Egypt, Egyptus, you know, it, it, it starts, it, and you see where we get our English from it. Mm -hmm. Ancient Egyptians did recognize their country with a special name. They called it Kemet. Uh, Kemet translates as the black country. That's not a racial designation. That's because the soil, uh, the soil is considered a, a great thing. Fer fertile soil was black. So they called their country Kemet out, out of the black, excuse me, out of the black country uh, from the soil. Excuse me. Now let's talk about Mitzrayim. So Mitzrayim is the Hebrew word for Egypt. Now Mitzrayim was, we, uh, we see first when you talk about Noah's second son, Right, Noah's second son, Chem, had a second son named Mitzrayim. And this is where the name, where we get the name for the country. But uh, the rabbis always have commentary about this. So what, what do the rabbis say the name comes from? Well, it comes, the, the root of Mitzrayim is Tsar, which means like a, a kind of like a, a restriction, like a narrowing. So Tsar being the root of the word Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim. Uh, that, that would be where you'd see most of the rhetorical commentary. Uh, however, there is a minority commentary, and I actually follow the minority for the reason. Uh, the minority commentary is that it actually comes from the word mitzar, which means boundary. Uh, so boundary instead of a, a narrowing. Uh, you know, if you're talking about bondage, the narrowing sounds really good. But when you look at all the other Semitic speaking countries, of the Middle East, be it the, the Ugarites or be it the Assyrians, the Babylonians, they all called it Mitzrayim. And no Babylonian ever claimed to be a slave in Egypt. Uh, so why the term Mitzrayim? Well, it's 
because he was using it in terms of it being a boundary. It was like the end of their known world uh, that you have this Mesopotamian mindset, this Middle Eastern mindset, which still is very Middle Eastern today. And anything outside the Middle East is outside their boundary, uh, which is where Mitzrayim most likely came from. Um, now let's get a little bit to the history. What happened first? What came first, the chicken or the egg? All right, and for that, I wanna use uh, this. Actually, I'm gonna switch back to this and then I'll come back there. And, I, and I'm gonna leave this big because I'm gonna focus down here. Uh, maybe that's too big for you. One second. Let me go here, there. Um, so there you go. Uh, so there's Memphis. I wanna just give you their sign now. I wanna give you some idea of, of where you are on the map. Okay, so then, uh, if you look down here to Thebes, where it's labeled Upper Egypt, and, and you see Hierakonopolis, so this is really where Egypt was born. Uh, you see Nakata here. Um, this, the, and then you can see, I love this map, you see the Valley of the Kings, where it's, it's labeled. This really gives you the basics you need. I've been for, there. For the earliest days of Egypt. Now, so let's, talk about, uh, let's talk about the birth of, of ancient Egypt. It was initially three lands, all here in what's labeled as Upper Egypt. And basically, probably around 3,600 years ago, 30, sorry, a lot more than that, around 5,600 years ago, around 3,600 uh, BCE, uh, some little villages started springing up around here all along the Nile. And these villages grew and grew over, and over the course of about 500 years, they grew and coalesced into three countries. All three of these countries were based in what's now in Upper Egypt. Uh, and then there was about a 200 year process of them fighting it out and merging. And then eventually around 3100 BCE, you have a united Upper Egypt, okay? This united Upper Egypt was under a King uh, Narmer. And we're gonna talk about Narmer in just a minute. Uh, but before I get into this really ancient stuff, I just wanted to mention, I, there's one archeologist I have to mention. Uh, I, you gotta give credit where credit's due. I said it's an amazing accomplishment that these people were able to discover what they've been able to discover. I was just giving you the, the description about hieroglyphics. And by the way, I should mention one other thing. Just to make it even harder to decipher the hieroglyphics, a lot of pharaohs would scratch out pharaohs names from previous administrations yeah. and make it their Solve own. That. So statues would scratch out one pharaoh's name and put another one. So imagine everything else I just told you and then dealing with the fact that they're erasing previous information and having to rediscover this, this information. So that's what these archeologists really get, get credit for. And I wanna give you one of the best ones. Uh, now understand in the 1800s and early 1900s, these guys were like cowboys, no better cowboys, yes. More like Indiana Jones, like real world Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones. And um, yes, some of them were looking for gold, right? Just in Indiana Jones, think of Raiders of the Lost Ark. You have your bad archaeologists at the beginning. You just wanted gold. Uh, but uh, you had a lot of good ones too, like Indiana Jones. So one of these good ones was William Flinders Petrie. Uh, he was born in 1853. He was a self-taught archaeologist. Uh, he, was from, uh, he was from Great Britain. Uh, his father was a surveyor. And he had a love for ancient history, but he followed his father's profession and became a surveyor. But as a volunteer, he went and surveyed Stonehenge and made the most accurate survey of Stonehenge ever, uh, which got a lot of attention in the academic world. So since he was on the cheap, he wasn't a professional, uh, professional archeological surveyor. Uh, they were able to hire him on the cheap to go to Egypt. And so he would go to Egypt, uh, first of all, just to survey pyramids. Uh, but this would start a very long career with some of the greatest discoveries in not only Egyptian history, but the history of mankind. His, um, there's a few things about them that stands out. I talked about gold. He did not want to find gold. He repeatedly said he didn't want to find gold because gold complicated things. Because then you have something valuable. You've got to pay people off. You've got to guard it. You have to worry about it. He really was looking for pottery. He always wanted to find pottery. And he wrote the first timeline of ancient Egypt just based on the pottery because the, bot the pottery changed over time. And that's exact that gave him the basics he needed for a timeline. 
And by the way, archaeologists still use that today. Yes, there's radiocarbon dating and all that, uh, but using pottery for timelines is still a very important tool to this day. Uh, and uh, Petrie was a master of it. He also found a lot of objects that there was not enough information at the time to understand. Uh, but what he did that no one else was doing at the time, if he thought something was important but he couldn't place it, he would very carefully diagram it, write everything about where it was discovered and catalog it so it could be found by future generations. So there's still people today studying his finds that he had no idea what they were, uh, but he saved them for future people who would. Um, also, the the Egyptians that were actually digging this, the, the labor force were paid pennies, uh, but Petrie had a deal. See, normally if you found a valuable object and you were for an archeologist, uh, you would just have to <clears throat> hand it over. You get nothing for it. So there was a lot of theft, right? A lot of smuggling. So what Petrie figured out is he would just pay fair market value. He found some gold, he'd pay, pay you fair market value for it. So that laborer would be much more inspired to just give it to him than try to smuggle it. He can get the money right there and then and get appreciation from Petrie. Meanwhile, Petrie has this object. So his ability to, his rate of, uh, of, um, uh, of return was much higher than the other archeologists in the field. There's also a story, by the way, that he found out the guy who was supposed to be paying his, his laborers, the very bottom of the workforce, he found out they weren't gonna be paid one week because the guy didn't make it down there and it was inconvenient for him. So Petrie walked 20 miles through the desert in a day to make sure that his laborers had money before the weekend started. So it tells you what kind of person he was. Uh, he wasn't Jewish, but uh, you, you gotta appreciate someone like that. Um, his first big, big dig would be Tanis. He'd also do the first large excavation of Luxor, which is much better known today, but he was all over. His greatest discovery was the Minerpta stone, or Minerpta stele. When we do the Exodus lecture, this Minerpta stele is extremely important uh, for the story of the Exodus. So don't worry about it now, but it's gonna come back. Also, I should mention his, his most famous student was Howard Carter, who is known for, uh, which is very well known uh, for being the guy that discovered King Tut's tomb. So his best student was Howard Carter. Okay. Now let's, let's look at the Narmer uh, palette. Uh, that's this, although I actually I took, I got a picture of it because I saw the, I wanted to get you a higher resolution picture. So I hope this one's a little bit clearer. Okay, so there were a couple of archeologists that were, I don't wanna say they were bad, but let's just say they were a little bit more into gold than Flinders Petrie was. And they're digging around near Canopolis uh, in 1897. And while they're digging around, they find this big tablet. This is about um, two feet by one and a half feet, if you want to know the actual size, okay? So they find this, and they're actually not really interested in it. They're looking for gold, and they kind of toss it aside. Well, they can't really toss it, it's too heavy, but they kind of push it aside. Um, and they're not really worried about it, but they do send it back for studying. Flinders Petrie happens to see it when it's sent back, and he's like, this isn't just any palette. This is, this is something big. So... Uh, with Petrie's, with Petrie backing it, it's sort of being carefully studied. And now I'm going to explain what it is. This is a gigantic cosmetic palette, but it's obviously made for decorative purposes. What I want you to see from it is this is a picture of the first king of United Egypt. His name was Narmer, King Narmer. Uh, this tablet was was made in approximately 3100 BCE. Look at the quality you still have of it. And it tells you a story, okay? So, so the story it's telling you is the, this is the unification of Egypt. This is when the, this is King Narmer, the founder of the first dynasty of ancient Egypt. And this palette right here is his monument for his accomplishment. So I'm gonna show you a few things. One is, um, up here, if you look, this symbol here, this is a, a catfish. I know you can't see it. That's better. Ooh, that's better. Okay, this is a fish. This is a catfish, and this is a chisel. So the, the catfish is nar, and the chisel is mer. So that's where we get the name King Narmer. So he used a, so this, again, gives you a good taste of hieroglyphics. He used a catfish and a chisel to say his name, which was simply Narmer. Okay, now, um, also... King Narmer had, uh, can tell us a few things just looking at him. Okay, first of all, we already see the style that we'll recognize for the rest of ancient Egypt. 
right? You have the head turned to the side, but the body facing you. Uh, this right here is called the smiting pose with, the, with his arms one down holding the, the enemy and the other with the arm up about to strike. He's holding a mace. This is a very common image throughout Egypt and the Middle East. In fact, uh, if you ever go to the Carlos Museum, uh, the Carlos Museum has a statue of Baal, the Canaanite god, and he's in this exact same pose, even though it's a different time and a different place. Uh, so, so very common. Also, notice the king is much bigger uh, than the other people. That's, you'll see that for the rest of ancient Egypt. Uh, also, this, this nose, see how the nose is pierced and there's a chain on it? This symbolism is also uh, used all over Egypt and the ancient Middle East for showing that the people have been defeated and they're now under the thumb of, so, of whatever great king. Um, the, these cows right here are a, are a Egyptian goddess named Hathor. Uh, Hathor is the, is the goddess of love and the goddess of the sky. So it's kind of saying this goddess in the sky is looking down on this, this king. Uh, these, these little branches you see right here are papyrus plants, okay? The, um, uh, also, look at the sandal bearer. Now, for those of us who are about to learn about the burning bush, right? Notice the king takes off the sandals when he's on holy ground, all right? So that should remind you of the burning bush. When, Mos when Moses walks into the burning bush, Hashem tells him to take off his sandals, takes off his shoes. He's on holy ground. Uh, so the sandal bearer, who notice he's much smaller than the king, is holding the king's sandals on the, this holy land. Um, the uh, crown of the king, I just want to mention, you're going to see these two crowns. The king's right here and the king's right here. Uh, you're going to see these crowns over and over again. It's the crown of, the, of upper Egypt and the crown of lower Egypt. And a lot of times you see them together. Uh, but so this is showing that he's, that he's ruling over this entire land. That he's wearing both these crowns. And the others are clearly just defeated peoples. I'm not going to go through one or the other. I also say that the bull down here, this, this bull will always be a symbol of power, uh, both in Egypt and in the Middle East. Um, so uh, this, this is where I want to end tonight's lecture. Um, now, there's still a lot of material that I've actually skipped and a lot more material that I still have to go over. Uh, but next time, what I want to do is we're going to actually do an analysis about bricks. And we're talking about how bricks tell us about ancient Egypt, but also how if just listening to this is going to give you a lot when you do your Seder at home. And unfortunately, I think we're all doing our Seders at home this year. Uh, and we're going to have less people, so we need more to talk about. So what I'm going to do is load you up next Thursday with some information to share at your Seder. But at the same time, we're going to talk about the pyramids being built, who built them, why they were built, what Jews have to do with it, if anything, and we're going to do an analysis on bricks uh, in, with the viewpoint for the Seder. Do I, do I um, hope that works for everyone. I hope it's interesting to you. If not, Thank you tell so me. much. <laughs> no problem. Uh, and we'll be Thank back. Uh, so next Thursday, we'll do same time next Thursday. Uh, if you have any other ideas, if you have anything else you want me to go through, then uh, please just uh, reach out to me.